Welcome to an introduction to economics brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. For more information about Park Bench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com. This short podcast is the first of two that will introduce the idea of welfare economics. Remember that economics is all about the problem of resource allocation, and that applies to this topic, welfare economics. We have also discussed the fact that whether the economy is a market economy or a planned economy, the problem is the same. The methods were of course different. Now we are going to ask some different questions. Allocation is about more than distribution of resources. We need to ask about their allocation. Are the allocations efficient and are they equitable? You will see we have introduced two terms here, efficiency and equity, and these will be the focus in this podcast. Pareto efficiency means that no reallocation is possible to make one person better off without making somebody else worse off. This is the idea we shall explore. Whether a given distribution is equitable is harder to determine since this term is more subjective. It refers to a fair distribution of income and wealth. The part of economics that is concerned with economic efficiency and equity is referred to as social welfare. If we had to state a social welfare function, then we would be trying to identify all the factors that we believe affect social welfare. We might agree on some of these fairly easily. Few would argue that social welfare is related to the quantity of goods and services available, or the way in which they are distributed and probably we could agree it is related to the health of the community and maybe the amount of leisure time. However, since we are becoming subjective, the question is, where is an end to this? How about pollution, rain and sunshine being factors that we could consider important in social welfare? Wait a minute, let us get this a little clearer. Here are two ways of looking at social welfare. The first says that social welfare is a function of quantity of goods and services, distribution of resources, health, leisure, and as many other factors as you can think of that are important. The second says that it is a function of the utilities that make up all of the individuals in a society. That is all very well, but we are trying to make some sort of measurement. What is that measurement about? We need to try and determine whether a specific change in the economy, which makes some people better off and others worse off, will increase or decrease social welfare. For this we must try to consider efficiency, and we stay with the Pareto idea of efficiency. Then we look at equity, and whether there is any conflict between efficiency and equity, and finally we'll just take a brief look at compensation tests and cost-benefit analysis. We have efficiency in the Pareto sense when it is not possible to change the allocation of resources in a way that makes someone better off without at the same time making someone else worse off. We cannot increase the production of one good without reducing output of another. We cannot increase the consumption of one household without reducing the consumption of another. The state is called Pareto efficiency, but you will also come across Pareto optimality. Don't worry, it is still the same idea. The requirements to achieve the state can be summed up. There must be efficiency in production. What do we mean by this? The economy must be employing all of its factors of production in efficient combinations so that it is on and not inside its production possibility frontier. There must be efficiency in exchange. It must be impossible to redistribute a given stock of goods and services in such a way that benefits someone without harming someone else at the same time. There must be an efficient output mix. It must be possible to change the the actual combinations of goods and services produced in such a way that will benefit someone without harming someone else. We are now going to set up a model to examine these. The model is going to be based on a number of assumptions. There are two goods. We shall use our friends cloth and food. There are two factors of production, capital and labour. There are only going to be two people in our society. We shall call them person A and person B. 
The goods will be exchanged one for another. There is no outside trade. You may see this exchange of goods referred to as a barter economy. Because we are dealing in twos, two goods, two factors and two people, this is called the 2 by 2 by 2 model. It may not be very realistic, but we can use it to derive results. Before we move on, let us remind ourselves of something we met earlier in our study of microeconomics. Isoquant curves are contour lines joining together all the different combinations of two factors of production that are physically able to produce a given quantity of a particular good. We shall now look at the isoquant curves for our two goods, food and cloth. The total supply of labour is OL and the total supply of capital is OK in each case. Remember that labour will be in units per time period. It is unlikely that the two goods would have identical isoquant curves, so we have shown a small difference here. F1, F2 and F3 are the isoquant curves for food and C1, C2 and C3 are the isoquant curves for cloth. Now, here is a neat little idea. We turn the isoquant map for cloth upside down. It is still the same map. O is still the origin and OL the total supply of labour and OK the total supply of capital. An increase in labour now is shown by moving from right to left along the x-axis and an increase in capital by moving from the top to the bottom along the y-axis. Then we do a nifty trick. We put the two maps for food and cloth together to give us a box diagram in production. This idea was actually the work of two British economists, Edgeworth and Bowley, so it's sometimes called the Edgeworth-Bowley box diagram. The important part to remember is that our origin for food is at OF, and the origin for cloth is at OC. Now any point inside the box is a possible production unit. We've shown a point P here. At this point OFK1 units of capital are used for food and OCK2 units of capital are used for cloth. Also OFL1 units of labour are used for food and OCL2 units of labour are used for cloth. Although P is a possible production point, is it an efficient one? There must be an infinite number of points where food isoquants are tangent to cloth isoquants. Let us next consider these. We have shown a number of these and have joined the points with a line. The line joining all the tangency points is called the contract curve. It is all the points on the contract curve that are technically efficient and the points such as P, which do not lie on the curve, are technically inefficient. Quite simply, if we move from point P to point R, then food output, the F2 curve, remains the same. However, cloth output moves from C2 to C3. The cloth output increases. Remember, C3 is further from the origin than C2. So anywhere along the contract line, it is not possible to increase the production of one good without reducing the production of another good. All the points on the contract curve are technically efficient. Consider the slopes of the isoquants. The marginal rate of technical substitution of capital for labour is given by the slope of the isoquant. For efficiency in production, the slope for the isoquant for food will be equal to the slope for the isoquant of cloth. The marginal rate of substitution, technical substitution, capital for labour food, is equal to the marginal rate of technical substitution capital and labour for cloth. If this condition is not satisfied then it is possible to reallocate resources and produce more of one good without affecting the production of the others. What is the relationship between the contract curve and the production possibility frontier? If a point on the contract curve can only be reached when resources are being used efficiently then all the points must correspond to points on the country's production possibility frontier. P, Q and F were on the contract curve and so must be on the production possibility frontier. Point P was not on the contract curve and must therefore not be on the production possibility frontier. 
Let us move on and consider the efficiency of exchange. We are going to consider efficient distribution. Remember, we are considering whether distribution is efficient, not whether it is equitable. For this, we look at the indifference maps. We show the indifference maps for the two individuals and the indifference curves that relate to food and cloth. As before, we are going to turn one of these upside down. We have turned the indifference curve map for individual B upside down to get our box diagram. And we have also drawn in our contract curve to link together the tangency points. At point F, individual A consumes OAF 1 tonnes of food and OAC 1 metres of cloth. Individual B consumes OBF 2 tonnes of food and OBC 2 metres of cloth. As before, we can see that moving to a point such as G would be a situation where an individual was better off, but the other is no worse off. The contract curve for exchange joins the points of tangency between A's indifference curves and B's indifference curves. Remember that the slope of an indifference curve is the marginal rate of substitution of one good for another. So, for efficiency in exchange, the marginal rate of substitution of food for cloth for A must be the same as that for B. We can say that the marginal rate of substitution food for cloth for A is equal to the marginal rate of substitution food for cloth for B. So we have two conditions here, one relating to substitution of capital for labour, the other relating to substitution of food for cloth. So MRT SKL food is MRT equal to MRT SKL for cloth and MRS FCA equals MRS FCB. The economy is producing at a point along its production possibility frontier. Where is this point along the production possibility frontier where it is impossible to move without one individual becoming worse off? It is where the marginal rate of substitution for both individuals must be equal and the marginal rate of transformation for both individuals must be equal. So MRSFC is equal to MRTFC. So for economic efficiency in the Pareto sense, MRTS should be the same for both goods and MRS should be the same for both individuals. The common MRS should then be equal to MRT. Our model only represented two individuals, but we can easily amend it to apply to a general situation. The marginal rate of technical substitution of every factor should be the same for all goods. The marginal rate of substitution for every good should be the same for all individuals. The marginal rate of substitution should be equal to the marginal rate of transformation for all pairs of goods. We shall return to our first idea about changes in social welfare. Using Pareto efficiency, any change in the organization of production and distribution which benefits someone without harming anyone else will increase social welfare. This ends our first podcast on welfare economics, brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you every success in your studies. For more information on Park Bench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.